All right, thanks. Um, usually I tend to speak too fast in my talk, so I'm pretty sure we'll make it until lunch. Um, yeah, welcome. I named my talk, if 42 is the answer to all questions, then why is the question to all answers? I guess all of you know already that 42 is the answer to all questions, but we want to look, today we want to look at uh, what is the question to all answers. This is regarding JavaScript and architecture. This, code does not con uh, <laughs> this talk does not contain any code, uh, nor do we talk about any design patterns or other technical aspects. OK, as always, uh, my name is Thorsten. I work as a software architect and scrum master. I've been in the IT since 1998. Um, usually, I focused on Microsoft technologies, but uh, I've always um, had focus uh, on, on JavaScript as well. So front-end technologies, JavaScript has always been a, a beloved friend of mine. Well, yeah, that's, that's me, actually, in, in uh, 1989, sitting in front of my desk and uh, do some machine code programming in, on my Commodore C64. Um, who of you guys remembers the C64? Whoa. Oh, that's, that's quite a lot, actually. Yeah, we, get, we will get back to that later on. Um, I came a long way from this ugly desk to uh, this beautiful stage here, and uh, so did JavaScript, right? JavaScript was kind of invented in 1995, and uh, I touched JavaScript, uh, as I said, in 1998. And I remember HTML4 and CSS2 coming up, and um, we had browsers like uh, IE4 and Netscape 3, or was it vice versa? I don't know, I can't remember. It was a hard time, actually. JavaScript, that time, was more an addition to website programming. Like, everything was rendered on the server side, and we just used it for maybe uh, like user input validation or tiny little animations. So it was enough to have a function that just does something, and that's all, right? Um, but then uh, JavaScript over the years evolved to a real major language. Um, remember like Ajax coming up, 1999, and uh, I think Google Mail used it extensively. Then there was jQuery in 2006. And 2010 was the, kind of the year of the frameworks when all the big frameworks came out, like Ember, uh, Backbone, Knockout, Angular, right? And all that. So, as I said, it evolved, and now it's a major language, and we're moving to the enterprise level with JavaScript. It's not just a, a script kiddies language anymore. OK, so I took time to, to dig deeper into it, because I thought if, if we are doing enterprise software application, um, um, software development, uh, I might look at all the frameworks that are outside in the world. And uh, I found that on the internet, and it says 20 top frameworks you should look at. There's other articles saying 100 frameworks you shouldn't look at, but these are just the top 20 frameworks we should look at. And I thought to myself, well, I, I don't have time to analyze like 20 frameworks. What are their capabilities and what are they made for? What, is, what, is, what are they good for? I don't have the time, actually. So I figured decisions about frameworks can get very stressful in, in, in daily life and in daily work for me and for you. And um, so I guess people just make it easy for them and pick the one that is very popular, right? The popular ones, the cool frameworks, that's, that, that's what people use. Um, and that brings, like, that brings up a problem, actually. I found that on the net as well. Like Cassandra Perch, she's a speaker from Austin, Texas, and she had a talk 2014 on a, on a JS conference. And she says JavaScript has a fanaticism problem. I think that that is a result of uh, there is too much on the market, and I've tried to focus on just one thing, and people try, they get really fanatic about it. Like, um, you might have experienced that, right? If you meet someone who's Angular a coder, there's just Angular in his world, and there's nothing else. And once Angular 2 comes out, uh, everyone seems to rush from Angular 1 to Angular 2, and all the, the other old frameworks are just old shit, and everybody wants to do the new shit. So we have a fanaticism problem. Um, but how can we solve that problem? 
Therefore, I guess, uh, we have to look not only at the frameworks, but at the underlying architecture, which makes sense because I consider myself software architect. Um, frameworks, like every framework, framework come with an architecture, right? I mean, I mean Angular comes with MVV, uh, OpenUI, if someone knows that, it's MVC, React is just the V, and there's even more on the server side, like all the node guys have different architectures on that. Um, so, I think we first, before we, we make the decision what framework we want to pick, we, make, we have to look at the underlying architecture and decide what kind of architecture is the right one for our project. And to figure that out, I'm too far away, right? Um, we uh, have a look at what really is architecture then? What do we talk about if we talk about architecture? Um, and I say, like, a couple of good people say, architectural decisions are the ones that are hard to change. So what does it mean? Um, like, imagine every software design is, uh, uh, sorry, every architecture is software design, but not all software design is considered architecture. If you have, like, a, an application and you're using kind of um, design pattern, say, a command pattern, and you figure out your, your command pattern is like the components are too tiny, too small, you can't, you can't handle that, so you want to consolidate some of the stuff. You can go piece by piece and replace that code. If you want to go from uh, like a monolithic application to some kind of microservices, you have to, to change the entire thing. So that's what I consider hard to change. So this is probably what your architecture is all about. And there's another thing you, uh, that's, that's to mention. Architectural decisions, they're not based on functional requirements. Um, imagine what is, what is a functional requirement. For example, I want to log on to a system. I want to see a list of uh, addresses ordered by name, for example. Well, I can do that in my, on my Commodore 664, right? That's, it is possible. I mean, it will take a while, and it's probably not really performant, but I, I can fulfill the requirement. So it's got nothing to do with architecture. So architectural decisions are rather based on quality attributes. We also call them non-functional requirements. I mentioned performance, right? C64 is not really performant. Um, so performance is one of the quality attributes that is um, a basis for a, an architectural decision. Okay, now talking about quality attributes. So what are these quality attributes? Um, therefore, uh, we can look at the ISO 9126. Keep that in mind, I didn't write it down. And uh, it comes out with a, with a cool list of quality attributes. What we see here is just the first level. There's, there's more, there's even more subcategories. But I think for this talk and uh, with a view at lunch, uh, we, we keep this uh, on that level. So it's about reliability of our software. Uh, we talk about the functionality. Is it maintainable? Is it performant? What about the usability? What about portability? That's all quality attributes we got to look at if we want to make a decision about what kind of architecture do we need. Sounds easy, eh? But it isn't, because there is another issue coming up. Some of them are contradictory. Like imagine um, performance and maintainability. You want to have an application that's highly maintainable. So you might write small components that you can just plug in and out, that you can exchange, delete, add new stuff onto it, but you got all the communication over it instead. So it might not be as performant as you want. I mean, the fastest application I ever written was in C++. It was one function having like 500 lines of code and that was lightning fast. Do you think that's maintainable? I don't think so. Um, so it's about to us to pick the ones that we need. Like we want to know what, our art, what, are, what are our attributes for the project uh, we have to make. So how do we get there? Actually, we can, we can go to our product owner and say, hey, product owner, here's the list, here's ISO 9126, uh, just pick some of your attributes and I'll bring you the perfect architecture for that. And he looks at the list and what do you think? What do you think what he says? Yeah, 
exactly, right? That's it. Um, you'll say, I'll take them all because performance, yeah, that's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I think we need that. And we need maintenance and we need all the other stuff, good usability and all that. So that doesn't actually bring you far. Um, has anyone seen that? The, the golden circle from Simon Sinek? Who saw that already? Hands up, please. OK, quite a few. Um, so Simon Sinek, he, he invented the golden circle. And he says there's a circle consistent, uh, that consists of three layers. There's an outer layer. He, he, he says that's the what layer. And then there's a how layer. And the inner layer is why. What, is, uh, what do we want to build? What kind of application do we want to build? Wh how is? Um, how do we want to build that? So that's, that's just a few lesser people know how to do it while anyone else knows what to do. And then the inner question is the most important, and that's why I, I named my talk by that. It's why do we do that? And people would say, we built an application because we want to roll out on the market and make money. But Cynic says, that's not why, that's a result. We want to look at what really drives us. What, what's, what's our cause to do things? So why, like how, how and what is very rational? Why is something that's inside us, a very emotional thing that really drives us? And um, sometimes I, when I enter, like when I come to a customer and they have a project and I ask, dear customer, so what kind of architecture are you using for your existing application? And they say, um, we use MVC, just an example. And I say, OK, so why do you use it? Like, why do you use it? And the customer says, well, you know, it's so decoupled, and it's maintainable, and we got different teams working on different layers. And this. that's a result, actually, right? So I say, yeah, that is what it does, but I want to know why you choose it. And then they, mm, uh, I don't know, uh, because everybody did it? Or uh, my boss wants it? Or the guy who invented it, he left two months ago, we don't know. So most people don't know what really drives them, what, what brings, what is their innermost thoughts uh, as a basis for their, uh, how they react. Again, why is the really important questions that we got to ask? Um, I, try, I tried to find a really cool example, uh, but I, I, I didn't. Um, here's one that's maybe uh, a little bit ridiculous. So imagine you ask a customer, so why do you want you to build your software? And he says kind of things like, well, I want to be the first on the market that has an application with a UI that's usable for people from age 6 to 99 at the same time with the same UI. So I want to consolidate every needs of like every age group on one UI. I've, I've never seen that before. And um, what, is, what about my text, actually? Yeah. And so how, did, how can you reach that? And he says, yeah, I want to pick a bunch of good A++ developers with a strong focus on UX and UI. And what we're going to build? Yeah, probably we need to build a new JavaScript framework uh, that has UI components that really have a strong focus on, uh, on that what I want to reach. It's a, it's a silly example, but it, it, I hope it shows that thinking from the inside out brings you way closer to what is really what you want than thinking from the outside in. OK, so um, I'm, I think I'm too fast. Anyway, uh, how do we get there? So how do we get into people's minds to figure out what their why is? It's quite easy, right? You go there and pick it out. But it's, it's not, actually. Because only 10% of our decisions are made consciously. That means like 90% of our decisions are made unconsciously. So they're idle in the background. Your, your brain is in an idle mode. Uh, that's actually a good power management. Uh, but it leads us software architects to a problem because if you're in a room, say, with your product owner, he might be influenced by so many people, like over the day, over the year, like all overall, by his wife, his coworker, um, 
his team lead, so that his really own decision, his why, is kind of fuzzy thing. Uh, for example, you're sitting in the room having a meeting, and there's your product owner, and you say, you know what, product owner, what is the main thing about your software? And I stay with a performance and maintainable thing because it's easy to explain. And he says, you know, we want to roll out our software internationally in five years. We want to go Middle East, Asia, the US, wherever. We want to start small, but we want to grow. So keep it as modular as possible. And then the boss is in the room, and he's the one, he started programming like 20 years ago in his basement. We all know these guys, right? I did that by myself. And I always, like my applications have always been performant. So that's the main thing. The world is just all about performance. So he might have influenced your product owner, and he might not say what he really thinks. He might say, yeah, modularity is a, it's a big thing, but actually it's, it's uh, more about performance in this application. So you go home, and you choose not, like, not to use an, a framework. You write everything on your own, and you write the lightning fast, the fastest application ever written in JavaScript, and you deliver after six months. The problem is the team lead, he's been sent to Sweden, wherever, <laughs> I don't know, any kind of country. And um, your product owner is still in the room and he says, yeah, that's, that's cool, it's very fast. But now we want to add on internationalization and we want to add on time zones because we want to roll it in. And then there you are and saying, yeah, that's fine. Uh, but I don't think we can do that because we wrote kind of spaghetti code and it's really fast, but we can't maintain it. So got to start up from scratch or whatever. So you missed the point, right? You picked the wrong architecture and maybe the wrong framework because you didn't have the right information. But still, I believe there is a chance to get there. Um, I call it creating atmosphere. I said, Everything is inside us, and we, we have to bring it outside, right? You can take the product owner and uh, go to a Zen meditation kind of thing, or do a yoga class, right? That leads people to, uh, to find out what their innermost thoughts are. But that's probably not possible in, in daily life. But still, we can get as close as we can. And there's, there's room in every company. Um, like the cantina, or the good old coffee maker. Um, I had the best, really best results talking to people uh, outside their office environment. Like in a, in a room, there's just a coffee maker, you're there, two people, just talk about it. It's kind of a fearless situation, and people open their selves way more. Um, also, if you have a launch, or just do a quick walk around the building, right? Just five minutes or 10 minutes around the building, that helps a lot. I experienced that. Um, and then the product owner, like he might open himself and say, you know what, my team need, they're going to ship him over to, to, to Sweden <laughs> in a couple of months. And he's kind of a nerdy idiot. What we really need is an application that's modular because the plans of the company are to roll out internationally. It brings you much more closer to what really is that drives the people, the company. What is their vision? Where, where do they want to go? And therefore, if you know that, you figure out what the quality attributes are. And if you know the quality attributes, then you know may, maybe what kind of framework you want to pick. So you can filter the top 20 frameworks up to top four frameworks, so, and it's much easier to, to decide then. And hopefully, in the end, you satisfy yourself and your customers' needs. Um, how much time do I have? A couple of minutes, right? Uh, there's a little bit more. Like, there's even more constraints. It's not all about the why. You should consider other things if you think about your architecture and your framework. There's things like budget and time. And uh, think about you have limited budget and limited time. And you have a crew that's I have a limited knowledge kind of thing. So imagine there's a crew, like 10 people that are Commodore C64 programmers. And you don't have time and just a small budget and you have to do a really big project uh, and you decide to go Angular 2. That's probably not going to work. That's an extreme example, but uh, I hope it shows what I want to say. 
Other things are important. So is there uh, companies, uh, like does the company have anything to mention? Like do they have licenses already? Is the maturity of the technology in point? Uh, what's the size of the team? Um, is it a waterfall or agile project? Right? That's, that does influence your reactive architecture as well. So what did we learn? I hope we learned. JavaScript evolved to a real major enterprise language, and we should behave like so, as we consider ourselves professional developers or architects, like I do. We should not pick a framework just by coolness factor or popularity. Um, that doesn't bring us far, because we might not find our customer needs. We should rather find the quality attributes uh, of the software to be built to find the right architecture that's underlying. And to do so, really try to figure out what really is the vision of the company and what really drives the customer. Use all your senses. Listen and hear. Just smell and feel, whatever it is. There's so many things you can take while talking to people that might help to, to find the right architecture and framework and make your customer happy. All right, uh, I finished my talk already. Um, I hope this was a little bit interesting for you. It is it's a technical, less like code less talk, and it's more about an esoteric thing. Uh, I hope you, got, uh, you people uh, take some of this home and use it for your next project. Um, if you want to discuss this with me, I'm here until, I believe, 1 or 2 p.m. Otherwise, uh, you want to find me on Twitter, or just drop me a mail, whatever you want, or forget about all that and just enjoy lunch. Thank you very much, and enjoy the conference.